All right, good morning. Uh, we're going to be talking today about uh, DDoS mitigation and protecting your game servers from attack, from DDoS attacks. My name is Sean Mark. I run the DDoS response team at AWS. We're part of AWS Shield, which is the DDoS protection product uh, within Amazon Web Services. Today we're going to talk about some DDoS vulnerabilities, uh, particularly the ones that you'll face running your game servers or web services, the Amazon approach to protecting web services, and then we'll cap things off with a live demo and I'll show you how to protect some servers. So uh, we'll talk first about some DDoS uh, threats and trends that we've seen over the years. Um, every year we see these threats growing larger and larger. Um, in 2016, we saw the Mirai attacks, which were about half a terabyte, and they threatened mostly websites. It was a layer 7 application flood that would um, target websites not protected by things like CloudFront. And earlier this year, we actually saw another record-breaking attack, which was exploiting a vulnerability within memcache servers. And these attacks actually exceeded one terabit per second in traffic. Um, we saw it both on Amazon and um, other networks. And so you can see that this is a growing threat. And if you're operating um, interactive game services that are online, things like latency and impact of performance can be a real concern um, when your players or your competitors or just kind of the trolls on the internet are focusing on uh, disrupting your services. <clears throat> so AWS Shield, we protect thousands of DDoS attacks every day. We see attacks in our regions and in our global network. Um, this is a screenshot of our threat environment dashboard, which I'll show you in a minute in our demonstration. It kind of just gives you a sense of where we see these threats. So why does it matter? Well, for one, it can impact the availability of your service, which is not good for your players, right? If they get disconnected from your, from your game or your matchmaking or even just being able to log into the service, it can affect your reputation, your revenue, and uh, your overall uh, performance of your application. Some of these attacks can last for even days. Um, you've probably heard of other gaming companies where they launch a new game and they were down for 12 hours. It can have real financial impact, especially if you're using microtransactions or you're charging a monthly subscription fee. Um, you know, there's not exactly an SLA on games, but it can be pretty frustrating for your customers when um, they pay a monthly subscription, they expect that game to be online, and then there's an attack against you or one of your partners or service providers that can impact availability of your game. And also, there's the overall kind of security aspect. People don't necessarily trust a company when they have to share information. They give you their credit card number, their home address. And oftentimes, DDoS attacks can be cover for or even conflated with things like information leaks and hacking. So we'll kind of just cover some of the basic DDoS attacks that you can see. Um, this is just represented by your standard OSI network model. And within AWS, the physical network is operated and managed by Amazon. So DDoS on the, phys the physical aspect of DDoS doesn't really apply. But for the network and the transport layers, you'll see these large volumetric attacks that can knock resources offline. Um, the, host, the network that might host your servers can be compromised. The servers themselves can become unreachable. Um, things like sin floods against your load balancers or your login servers can make those services um, unavailable or perform kind of in a degraded fashion. And then there's application attacks that can specifically target components within your application. This could be things like brute force login attacks, uh, query, query strings that you know, take, take your databases offline or brown out your services, things that can impede ad serving or matchmaking. And so um, some of the traditional challenges with mitigating these attacks is one that they're actually complicated and difficult to use if you don't have a a security staff on board on your team that works with attacks and mitigation technologies every day, it can be quite overwhelming. Oftentimes, you'll have to re-architect your, um, your applications to make room for uh, new um, steps in your pipeline to handle these uh, types of attacks. Um, and when you're responding to these attacks, um, if you don't have the trained personnel, you don't have the run books, you haven't done the game day, it can really be uh, a tense situation where you're flexing muscles that you haven't used before. Obviously, there's the performance degradation. Um, if you're running an interactive online game, you know, a DDoS attack, sometimes your users can sense the difference in a few milliseconds or latency in the interruption of you know, a real-time application. And, and sometimes um, DDoS attacks can take time to actually reach your effective mitigation where you, know, you push the button and nothing happens, right? So you have to try these different 
um, mitigations. Maybe there's a million different um, options you can enable in the platform. Like, oh, we'll try first the rate limit. Oh, that didn't work. All right, we'll try some, some geo-shaping. Okay, that didn't work. And you're kind of left to guess and pick which, which options to turn on. And lastly, is they're quite expensive. Um, if you're running your own physical data center, you're oftentimes over-provisioning. You have to have lots of capacity to handle hundreds of gigs of traffic. Or if maybe your network provider takes care of that for you, then you're buying an appliance that maybe will handle 100 times the amount of traffic you actually need in order to get the features you want. So at AWS, we took a different approach. Um, and I'll kind of walk you through the story of the last uh, five or six years. So AWS Shield standard uh, has been around for about six years. And Shield, the Shield team has been responsible for protecting Amazon.com, Amazon subsidiaries, and all of the web services. So services that you already use today, like S3, EC2, CloudFront, Route 53, ELB, they're all my customers, and we're responsible for keeping those services online. At reInvent in 2015, we launched the web application firewall, which is a uh, web DevSec model uh, web application firewall that allowed customers to programmatically approach web application filtering. We added support for CloudFront and ALB. And then reInvent in 2016, was it 2016? 2015. reInvent 2015, we launched Shield Advanced, which is a premium level of AWS Shield um, support for CloudFront, Route 53, and ELB. And then last year, we added support for EC2 by way of elastic IP addresses. And this is really important for gaming. So we offer Shield in two different flavors. Shield standard, which is basically DDoS protection for everyone. If you're on AWS, you are a Shield standard customer. And Shield Advanced, which includes a couple of extra things. Um, some enhanced protection techniques, access to the DDoS response team, or the DRT, that's my team, additional visibility and metrics, and some economic benefits we'll touch on in a bit. So first, I'm going to walk you through Shield Standard and kind of explain what the DDoS security posture looks like when you build your game or your application on AWS. First, you get automatic and total protection against Layer 3 and Layer 4 DDoS attacks against any AWS resource. This is comprehensive def uh, defense against SIN floods, volumetric attacks, uh, reflection floods, ACK floods, um, anything that would compromise the network availability of that resource. If you're using an edge service like CloudFront or Route 53, then it, you'll have comprehensive defense against any type of attack, including the ability to mitigate Layer 7 floods. And that's through use of AWS WAF. AWS WAF is a standalone service. It's pay-as-you-go. It uses a flexible rule language for you to craft your own rules. And it propagates pretty much instantly. When you click Submit, those rules are enforced immediately. And it's also programmatic. So you can use things like Lambda functions, cloud formation templates, all of the things you're used to when deploying infrastructure as code with AWS WAF. So let's talk about Shield Advanced. How is the protection better and why? So first, enable to mitigate an attack, you have to be able to see it. Right? So when we're protecting Amazon as a whole, we kind of have a baseline of traffic. And it's really large, right? many, many terabits. And, um, we design these protections to keep the service online, right? So our goal is to make sure that you know, someone bringing in a bunch of DDoS to EC2 on an instance nearby your instance doesn't affect your instance, right? So it's to keep EC2 online. With Shield Advanced, you can actually register the ARN for that elastic IP address or the ARN for your load balancer. And we baseline for your resource, and we're able to detect anomalies against your resource. So instead of seeing a, a, a forest of trees, we're able to look at your trees and tell when something's not, not correct. And so we have baselines, and we're able to detect anomalies much more fine-tuned to your environment. We also have some proprietary packet filtering. Um, there's a team within uh, Perimeter Protection, my department, called Blackwatch. It's one of the most distributed systems at Amazon. Uh, we run it in all of our edge networks, all of our POPs, and all of our regional transit centers. And it's deployed um, and accessed programmatically. So the Shield team, we're able to talk to Blackwatch and create uh, baseline profiles for different instance types. So whether you're running you know, an R class or an M class or a double XL, you know, whatever size instance you're using, we have calibrated profiles for those instances. So we understand what type of SIN rate limit or what type of um, packets per second the actual NICs on those instances, whether they are using the enhanced network virtualization or it's just a standard shared interface on a T2 micro. We understand that. And we're able to allow EC2 to communicate with Blackwatch and kind of raise the red flag when the instance feels pain, right? And so while your auto-scaling group might be scaling out 
or not if you haven't configured it, Shield Advanced can kind of proactively get in front of that resource before pain impacts your customers. You also have the uh, ability to um, create these uh, what we call mitigation profiles through the DDoS response team. So as a Shield Advanced customer, you can access the DDoS response team. You can say, here's my application. It's unique. These are the types of uh, traffic I expect to see. We shouldn't see packets that look like this or have this length or this header configuration. And we can go ahead and optimize the profile. So when there is an automatic engagement of mitigation, we won't be dropping the wrong packets on the floor. Also, some things like uh, traffic engineering. Uh, so if you have a global service and most of your users are in one region and a DDoS attack lands in that region, we're able to tap into bandwidth available in nearby regions. So I talked about the DDoS response team. The name's actually a bit of a misnomer. It's not an operations center staring at screens 24 hours a day, uh, you know, pushing buttons when things happen. We're more of an automation team. So we build tools and automation to enhance the response time and mitigation efficacy within the DDoS protection practice at AWS. But you can engage us. So we have preemptive engagements where we'll do things like architecture reviews and help you establish the right security posture for your application. We'll do fire drills and game days. Perhaps you have a launch or an event or a new expansion pack coming out, and we can help you prepare for that and make sure that your engineers know what buttons to push and how to engage us if something goes wrong. And we can also build those custom templates I mentioned before. In an emergency, if an automatic mitigation isn't sufficient, you have the ability to raise a, a ticket through support. Um, with the DDoS response team, we actually have a Lambda function specifically for the DRT, for Shield customers. So you can trigger that function based on health checks, an IoT button, a link in your own runbook, whichever, and raise a critical ticket directly to the DRT, and we'll hop into an AWS Chime bridge and help you through the process. So in addition to the enhanced protection and access to the response team, you also get some additional visibility, right? Because you're kind of used to giving up control and management in certain aspects when you migrate to the cloud. But visibility is still really important. So you can be accountable, knowledgeable, and um, be able to communicate what's going on with your application and with your security up to leadership or even to your customers. And so CloudWatch metrics is probably something you're used to building your operations around. Um, every Shield Advanced resource emits 15 different CloudWatch metrics. One binary metric that's called um, attack detected. You can use that to do things like trigger your ops pager, um, integrate with Slack, um, any kind of automated signal. Or you can even aggregate these signals together. So if any of your resources have a DDoS attack, notify the right people. And then 14 um, vector-specific metrics, like the size of the SIN flood, or the size of the amplification flood, or the you know, different um, metrics that actually have an integer value that go with it. Diagnostic reports. So every detected attack within Shield, there's an attack details page, where you can kind of go through and look at the characteristics of that attack. Where is it coming from? What are the top five source networks, countries? Uh, you know, what do the packets look like? And with application layer attacks, WAF will actually show you samples of the request. So you can kind of look at the different patterns inside that layer 7 header. And a new feature we launched last year at reInvent is the Global Threat Environment Dashboard. It's pretty exciting. I'll show it to you in the demo. It actually gives you a real-time view, or a near real-time view, of all of the DDoS attacks we see across AWS, uh, their vector, their type, their frequency. And you can kind of get a sense of what's going on in the landscape today. So there's also some economic benefits of Shield Advanced. It's not um, just additional, additional capabilities and access to the team. But also, AWS WAF, I mentioned, it's a standalone service where you pay as you go. All of your WAF costs are waived when you're in Shield Advanced. So they're included at no additional cost. And this is so you can have a holistic solution that includes both network layer and application layer solutions. And you also are eligible for um, credits when you scale in the response to a DDoS event. So maybe that's an auto scaling group um, scaling out to handle uh, additional packet rates, or um, a burst in traffic on your CloudFront distribution, or a few billion extra queries in your Route 53 hosted zone. Those things are now eligible for credit, so your invoice can't be used as an attack vector. So that's Shield Advanced in a nutshell. It's available on six services, the Elastic Load Balancer Classic, the application load balancer and the new network load balancer uh, by way of the Elastic IP addresses. Uh, Amazon CloudFront, that protects your global uh, CDN distributions. And Route 53 for your, uh, for your dom domain names. It's available in seven regions today and counting. And we're always adding new regions. And these are some of our flagship customers who've been with uh, Shield Advanced since from the beginning. And they're very, very happy. And I'm going to go ahead and walk you through the demo, and we'll protect a couple of EC2 instances. All right. 
So here we are logged into our AWS console, something no one should uh, be surprised by. And we're going to go ahead and go to WAF and Shield. And we put the WAF and Shield together because oftentimes you won't be using one without the other. Now, the first time you go to the Shield console, if you haven't subscribed, you'll get a little splash page that'll ask you to agree. Uh, Shield Advanced is sold on a 12-month commitment. I've already subscribed on this account. And so instead, what it gives me is a dashboard with a list of my protected resources. You can see I'm protecting a load balancer, a couple of CloudFront distributions, maybe my sign-up page and my download link, and then my hosted zone. That's like the domain name for my entire game company. But I also have some game servers, um, some, EL uh, some EIPs that are mapped to like a network load balancer or to um, the instances in the auto-scaling group uh, directly. So I'm going to show you how easy it is to register new resources for DDoS protection. I'm going to click Add Protected Resource. And by default, it's going to start in Region Global. So that's going to look for CloudFront distributions and Route 53 hosted zones. And it's going to scan my account and say, hey, look, you do have a CloudFront distribution you've not protected. But right now, we're interested in protecting um, some EIPs in North Virginia. So I'll go to US East. I'll choose Elastic IP Address. And there they are. I found them for me. I want to protect both of them. I'm going to choose Protect Selected Resources. And that's it. They're protected. So a lot of things actually happen in the background when you do that. Shield starts collecting telemetry specifically for those IP addresses globally around all of AWS's network. We're then able to establish baselines and learn what's normal for those resources. And then when abnormal things start happening, like we start getting mis uh, matches against our known vector detection or anomalies and spikes in entropy, we're able to then signal through both CloudWatch and through the Shield console that something's wrong and engage our automatic mitigations and start um, activating mitigations against those resources. And when an attack happens, you'll see in the console um, that an in this incidents panel will light up red, and you'll get more threats. I haven't had any on this account in the last 24 hours. But I can show you what it looks like when you do get an attack. So here's a historical view on some attacks I've had uh, last year and earlier this year. And so when you get an attack, it'll give you a link to the, cloud, uh, to the CloudWatch dashboard or the CloudWatch metric for that attack. So like for this SIN flood, for example, and this UDP flood, I'll just load them up. I think this is the tail end of an attack that I captured. All right, I'll come back to it. The wireless here is not playing very nice. I'll load up the attack details, show you what that looks like too. Right, so this was a 2.8 gig, um, gigabit per second SIN flood uh, against a, let's see if I can look at what the ARN was. Nope. There it is, against a CloudFront distribution. Um, oh, it was a UDP flood. So this is a UDP flood about 2.8 gigabits against CloudFront. Now, normally, if you're using CloudFront, you would never be able to tell that you were receiving a UDP flood, right? Because it's just a TCP-based HTTP CDN. And the attacks details page, you can see um, the top source countries, some of the top talker IP addresses, and then the networks that those that that traffic was coming from. And so I'll show you the global threat environment dashboard. This kind of gives you a snapshot at a glance of all of the DDoS attacks we see across AWS. I'm at the mercy of the Wi-Fi here. <laughs> here we go. I kind of want to change it to the last two weeks, but I don't want to push my luck. So you can see that uh, you, get, you get a heat map that kind of tells you where the most recent attacks are, some interesting information, a summary of the last day, uh, 701 attacks. And I think this resets at midnight. I don't think it's scrolling 24 hours. So just in the last 11 hours, we've had 701 attacks. Um, now, there might actually be more than that on Amazon. These are just the ones that actually map to resources that we're tracking for Shield, right? Shield standard or advanced. The most common vector is UDP reflection. And you can see the largest bit rate this morning, anyways, was only 55 gigabits per second. And this is a little histogram uh, and another histogram by vector. Now, for layer 7 attacks, uh, the AWS WAF is in the same console. Um, I won't give a full WAF demonstration, but what I will show is that um, you are able to create web ACLs, which is a, essentially a, a construction of rule sets where you create match conditions and then define actions. So you're able to kind of build your own web application firewall logic. And for customers who don't want to do that, um, we launched the marketplace last year at reInvent, where security partners um, will build their own managed rule sets, and you can subscribe to them for a small monthly fee and add those to your existing um, rule list. And so WAF and Shield Advanced combined gives you the ability to have an end-to-end -end kind of holistic security posture against denial of service attacks. And with that, uh, I want to thank you all for coming and have a great day.